Enter Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. What a title. Just like the main series, the Spectacular can be broken down to eras. The first years is when the book has no clear lead on the book. It switches between writers and artists in and out of constantly, sometimes every issue. There was another Spectacular Spider-Man book before this one. That lasted only two issues that I covered in another video. This is the big one. This is the one that ended up running for about 264 issues. This is the famous spin-off that you might have been heard of. This book is introduced to us by the man himself, Jerry Conway. Coming straight off O'Neill's run, it feels like wrapping up into a warm blanket. I'm home. The book begins with the return of Conway's original villain, Tarantella. The story deals with politics as Vice Counselor Edward Lansky is pushing for accessibility for, of education and when he, he's attacked by Tarantella. The school is having financial issues and the counselors and the mayors are being attacked all over. The twist in the end is that Lasky himself is the lightmaster, the villain behind everything and he's trying to steal money so he can donate it to the school in order to make himself look good as a, a chancellor. I complain about the lack of college in the main Spider-Man book. Spectacular deals with the school stuff more. Not that we see a lot of classes or anything, but we hang out in the uh, at the campus more, we deal with the politics of the campus, we name drop classmates and we get to meet them and we see Peter on campus more and we get to even know like people running the school. It's cool to finally get some focus on something that should be a much bigger part of Peter's life. It was just taken out of the main book and put it here. Spectacular Spider-Man begins during Wayne's run. Issue 1 happens in the middle of issue 163 of Amazing. This is the story of all the Kingpin's men. They mention it during the story, like literally this is the point where a Spectacular happens. From there onward, Spectacular releases at the same pace as Amazing, so each issue should correlate with a mainline book unless there was a delay or something happens, I don't know. The first 17 issues or so happen during Wayne's book and it's quite solid. Uh, Wayne's run ends up finishing pretty strong and I think Spectacular also begins quite well. They're kind of comparable quality honestly, so Spectacular doesn't really stand out that much. I'm jumping back to these issues after two runs that I didn't like, so I'm very excited about reading these issues, but if I had started doing Wayne's Days, I don't know, I, I probably wouldn't be too blown away by them, like, they're good, but so is the main book at this time. Spectacular has longer plots that take four to five issues to complete, while the main book only does one or two issues long stories with, like, one exception or so. The book focuses on Peter's college camp. Flash Thompson is one of the big supporting characters in Spectacular and he gets quite a bit of time dedicated to him, as he should. Chad Thompson reunites with Shasha and the book shows their romance. Ever seen Apocalypse Now? Yeah, it's like that. Flash was in Vietnam, had to order an airstrike and met a Shasha, didn't want to anymore, strike caught call anyway, and now quietly Flash carries that PTSD alone like the masculine alpha he is. Shasha was one of the Vietnamese women there he befriended. She's now in America and Flash is really desperate for her attention. Um, yes, I don't think the romance itself is very good. I don't think these two have good chemistry. Shasha's personality is very wooden. Uh, I can't see these two being in a room together and having a good time. And that's something every relationship needs. These two just don't bounce off of each other some like uh, MJ or Peter do. Like this book makes Flash look desperate. It's almost out of character. To me, this relationship reads in a bit of a different kind of way. To me, it looks like Flash went through something awful. And Shasha is the only person who can really understand it since she was there. Flash doesn't, cannot open up to his friends because they couldn't understand his Vietnam flashbacks. Shasha can. And I believe that is really the thing that Flash is attracted to. It's not enough for a relationship though, I think. Uh, Flash and Sasa are not meant to be together. The other part of Flash's attraction is guilt. He feels like he destroyed her home. He feels guilty for it. He feels responsible for it. Saving Shasha is a way of making up for his failures. This is not love. This is Flash's coping mechanism. It's interesting character work. And we'll see if in the long run the writers play into this. In which case, this is great stuff. If the writers don't realize this is what's going on and it's a genuine, authentic love story, uh, then it's probably going to be end up being kind of bad. But that's how at least I'm reading it, and I, I find it interesting. It's different, and it's, uh, I like it. One of the parts I absolutely loathe in Wolfman's run was his handling of MJ and their breakup. Spectacular does something to make MJ's story work a little better. It's still way too sudden, and it's a little stupid, but we do get to see MJ mourn the relationship like a human being. When a villain trashes Peter's apartment, she rushes to the scene. It's not enough by any means, but it's something. 
it's something Amazing Spider-Man never bothered, so those two, three times that happens here, it's, I'll take it. Shame it's relegated to a spin-off book, and it's something Spectacular is doing better than Amazing. After about a year, Bill Mandlow becomes the sole writer of the series, taking completely over with his issue 12. His first story is the one about Flash and Shasha. It's a longer arc, lasting about like five issues. The villains are Brother Power and Sister Son, and the pull one pulling the strings from the shadows is Hatemonger. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no! <laughs> Would you believe me if I told you this story is actually kind of good? Because it is. It's a little funny to read, but get past that, I, I ended up liking the story in the end. Yes, even this guy. He takes off the hood and reveals his face underneath. He has a wolf's head. I don't even know, man. I, I, I just think it's entertaining. I, what do you want from me? Uh-oh. More of the mongers minions coming at, at us from behind, playmates. Kill! In the name of love! Mandlow follows this five-issue epic with a bunch of short stories, and they're all consistently good. The standouts to me were Lightmaster story. He's a, he returns again, and I don't know. Once revenge on Spider-Man, I would too. Spider-Man can harm Lightmaster because he's pure light, so Spider-Man has to find a way around this little detail. I prefer it when Spider-Man defeats his villains through trickery instead of brute force. He the first time Spider-Man's solution was to trick Lightmaster to touch a light, which overcharges him, and I don't know something like I don't understand it, but it's cool. Uh, the second time here with Mantlo, uh, Lightmaster shows up and. I don't know, sucks the city, city's power grid, does the electro thing, and it causes a blackout. And he cannot exist without light, apparently, so he can't keep himself together and just fades away through his own hand. Sure, why not? There's a crossover with X-Men, specifically Iceman and Angel. Iceman is kidnapped and mind control, and Angel and Spider-Man must come up with a sa way to save their friend. The other is crossover with Moon Knight. Spectacular Spider-Man holds their first team up, and there will be another during O'Neill's run in the main book. I don't think I mentioned it in my O'Neill video, but that's a great issue too. That's a great issue under O'Neill. Not written by O'Neill though, so... <laughs> what are you gonna do? Moon Knight and Spider-Man work well together. I will say though, classic Moon Knight will never beat the Batman ripoff allegations. He has a moon cave. A moon cave! And he even has a back computer in there, like... Come on! <laughs> it's silly, but... I really, it's just, they're just really fun to see team up together, it's, I enjoy it, he, like, this guy's butler is flying around his moon chopper or something, it's just like, <laughs> yeah guys, sure, I, not a ripoff. I feel like Spectacular Spider-Man has more team ups than the main book during this era, White Tiger makes regular appearances, like they kinda want him to be a co-lead or something. And you get like uh, Moon Knight, you get Daredevil crossover, Iceman, Angel, Johnny Storm, Razorback, kinda, I don't know. I don't know if he has a book, never seen him before, but he does give a backdoor pilot kind of vibes. It's about eight or crossover issues without counting Whitey Tidy here. Amazing had like five issues during this era, and that's counting Punisher issues, who is a Spider-Man original villain. So it's, is it a crossover when it's Punisher? Spectacular is a bit of more of a team-up book. I guess that's just a way to increase sales for a spin-off or something. I don't know, but I did notice it. This whole thing is a rough count, and I'm not gonna go back and double-check. I don't care that much, but looking at the covers, that's about how the count seems to go. The biggest one is easily White Tiger. They're pushing White Tiger hard. He makes regular appearances as both Hector and as White Tiger. I, I, I think they wanted him to be a co-lead. I think they really wanted him to be a big thing here. Unfortunately, it's just not working. I don't care about Hector. I, I, I want to, but I, I just don't. I don't know. I, it's just like a robot, just nothing registering. I read about his uh, drama and I just like, nothing, no reaction. I don't know quite why he doesn't work. I Maybe it's because he... The book doesn't make me enough care about the things Hector cares about. He wants to protect like a poor neighborhood or something, but like I don't want to protect it. Like, why should I care? And I think the book doesn't give me a point of view there. It doesn't show me why this neighborhood or these people he cares about are worth protecting. It doesn't really do much in that area. I think that's what it's missing. Like, I care more about Aunt May. You know, that's what makes me care about Peter's adventures. Hector just fails to establish that. There isn't enough time for me to care about those people. Hector has a sister, and like I don't 
care about her. Like, I don't know her. I, I literally am trying to think of something to say about her, and I can't. Same with his girlfriend. Like, I just don't know them. I, I really don't know what makes them tick or why they are the way they are. I'm trying to come up with descriptions for them, but I, I can't really come up with much. Hector might care, but I don't. So, yeah, a lot of the book. It's one of the... Like, Hector isn't terrible, but it is something where it's just like you're spending a lot of time on a character. I just... That's just isn't working well enough to care, have such a large focus on him. And it's a shame. A White Tiger is a cool concept, but it's just... Hector isn't it. This ain't it. Buzuma is the lead artist of the series. At least early on, later, Mooney will kind of become the lead artist. And after that, I, I don't even know. Haven't read far enough to know past that. John Buzuma might sound familiar as Buzuma worked on the main book. And I talked about him before in like two videos. It's not the same guy. That was Sal. This is his older brother, John. Like, yeah, apparently there's two of these guys. <laughs> They're brothers. And I thought they were the same this whole time, but apparently not. I didn't realize that they were two different people. So I can't really tell which Buzuma did which issues. I know Sal does the sister-son brother power arc, but beyond that, I don't know. I don't feel like going back and double checking. I googled it, but Wikipedia for some reason doesn't differentiate between the Buzumas. They are all just Buzuma, so that's useless. I think Sal has improved from the mainline book Amazing Story, so I like him more. Again, I'm not sure if that's him be being better or if I'm just getting more used to his style, but I do find myself enjoying his art. One of the surprise artists is Frank Miller. He does like two issues here. Frank Miller would go on to do one of the most famous and definitive Daredevil runs ever and a few other minor books nobody cares about. This is a few years before that. Jesus, trying to imagine a comic book world without Dark Knight Returns or Year One is such a wild thought. I don't really have a point, it's just this is before a lot of these very definitive works. Like, they just straight up don't exist. Like, they have had not even imagined that type of stories yet. And it's just sometimes you, you, you hit with that where it's like, ah, yeah, this was before this dude went on and did that thing that, you know, kind of like define so much of modern comic books and you can kind of feel that it's just not there <laughs> you can kind of see the difference almost it's cool like i don't know maybe it was meant to be practice for him like they were already thinking about him on daredevil so they were like hey go do a crossover it's a preview for his daredevil book i'll read frank miller's daredevil soon after this run feel free to read it and join me on that whenever i get to it Miller does that one backup issue, and then a few months later he will go on to do, do the pencils for Mackenzie's Daredevil, and then a little bit later we'll take over the Daredevil book and give a pretty good run. Miller's two issues happen during possibly the biggest Spider-Man arc of the time, one of the biggest at least. It's a really epic story. It covers three different arcs, Moon Knight, Big M, and Carrion. It's definitely ambitious, and the story feels big and important while... Uh, they're not the same story by any means, they're clearly segregated. Uh, they all relate to one another, one leads to another. It's the uh, same week, uh, different days of the same week, you know. Moon Knight and Spidey fight against Magia, which is they used to be led by Silvermane, now they're led by Big M. They take down lower level leaders before going after the big man himself. After that, there's a breather issue about Hypno Hustler. He uses disco music to hypnotize his victims. While they're hypnotized, he steals their wallets amazing stuff. That is followed by the fight with Big M himself. Big M is built up as the leader of the Magia. He's meant to be bigger than Kingpin and Silvermane and Hammerhead. You know this because he is on above them on the moon computer. He's not in... But the problem is that Big M is just not as interesting and definitely not as cool as them, but he, I, I think he's meant to be. I think they're really trying to make him into a big deal and just think, eh, you know, it's eh. There's a crossover where Daredevil has to jump in and help Spider-Man. This is where Miller comes in. And, you know, it's it's a big story. You've got multiple heroes, multiple issues, long story arc, a lot of moving parts with Carrie and me messing around in there. A mysterious new villain who wants revenge on Spider-Man over something. It's a mystery. He trashes Peter Parker's apartment and leaves a message telling him Carrion's coming for him. Carrion is revealed to know who Peter Parker is. Carrion doesn't just want to take Spider-Man down. He wants to revel in this victory. When they fight, Carrion taunts Peter to use his spider powers. 
Even the titles of the stories are something like Dust to Dust. It's ambitious, and it was meant to hit big. So how does it do overall? I don't know. It's okay. Big M is kinda lame. Again, like, he's, he's, he has no backstory, so he's not interesting as a human person. He's not- he has no humanity, no sympathetic aspects of the character. It's just not an interesting in character, so all he has is his supervillain identity. You can absolutely carry a villain with pure presence. No, that's not- that's a very normal thing, but not when you look like this. That design combined with the name Big M, Max Marauder, yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I think the plot lines could have intertwined more to make it all come together a little bit more. Carrion wanted to work with Big M, and Big M refused, and as of now, it's just a lot of back-to-back -back stuff. It's it's fine, and this makes Peter fa fatigue, which will play a role in the next story, but I think the plot lines could have uh, been knit together a little tighter. But I'm gonna guess I'm not the only one who does, is not big on Big M. The standout is clearly Carrion. Carrion is the big one, so what's his deal? Carrion knows Spider-Man's identity and wants revenge. He has superpower where he, when he touches things, they rot away. Spider-Man throws a table at Carrion and the thing instantly rots into nothing. To dust, you would say. That's a creepy power, like that's really weird. Uh, Carrion's design is disturbing, he looks like a walking corpse, a ghoul that has returned to take his vengeance upon the world. He knows too much, he's too powerful, and he comes across relentless. He overpowers Spider-Man and captures him, and we finally get our reveal. After so many issues of build-up, Carrion is a clone of Miles Warren, aka the Jackal. Oh no. Oh no 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 no, clones. I'm not ready for the clone saga, please no, no clones! Spider-Man's only weakness. So, clone lore. Before their battle during Conway's run, Man, it makes complete sense that Warren is buff, he should be. It still just feels wrong to see him be this buff, you know, just like something about it, just, that just don't look right. Warren created a backup of himself, like a backup clones, I guess in case something would go wrong. Something did go wrong, so the clone is now mad. To be honest, Carrion is not a terrible continuation of Clone Saga. My dread for the clones comes from stuff that happens later in the 90s. Ignoring what is coming 14 years later after this story, this story itself is quite intense. Spider-Man has been going through a lot, he's tired from Big M and the, his gang of bad guys, Spider-Man's leg is messed up, Carrion threatens Hector, Flash, and even Aunt May. Peter's physically, emotionally, and mentally not ready for this fight. It feels climactic. I gotta get this out of the way. What are the Jackal's powers exactly? He beat Spider-Man in a one-on-one -on -one fight back in Conway's run, so he must have super strength and agility at least. I don't think they ever explained how he got those powers, which is weird, but I ignored because everything else about Conway's run is magnificent. He's supposed to be a normal old man. Now the clone can kill things because with touch alone he can repel organic matter around him, allowing him to levitate and do a force repulse. I don't know exactly how that works, but I, I don't know, cloning gave him those powers. Uh, Carrion is super cool, but I, I just can't get past this. How? This bothered me during Conway's run, but now they're doubled down on the unexplained powers, so I'm gonna call it out now. The explanation given is the clone process messed him up and gave Carrion's extra powers of teleportation. He can turn intangible, and te he has telekinesis powers? There's a lot of stuff, and I, I, I think it kinda makes him intimidating, but it's so much, and it just feels like they're giving him everything, and it's like... And it just kind of gets a little silly. It's, it's too much. It's too much. F and it kind of starts to take away from the threatening to kind of like, okay, this guy's just kind of giving it whatever what power he needs at the time. Whatever looks cool. The final issue of the arc gets really graphic. You see Carrion's henchmen get last crusaded and Carrion gets, I don't know, amoeba by the spider amoeba, a tentacle monster he created. This is pushing the edge. Spider-Man hasn't been this graphic before this point. Even more messed up, Spider-Man kind of just watches Carrion get Rule 34, and he just says, eh, probably could, couldn't help him, and besides, I didn't really wanna. Ice cold, Webhead. Ice cold. Carrion is the highlight of Spectacular Spider-Man, but it isn't quite on the level of the best stories. It tries really hard and clearly wants to be the best, and I appreciate that, and I really do, but it's a bit unfocused, and it has too many reaches for my taste. It just doesn't pull together as well as I'd like. It's still great, it's still worth a read. 
And John Romita uh, Jr. is one of the more interesting ones, as he does his first Spider-Man issue during this run. He would become one of the most notable people to ever work on the character, so that's cool to see. I think there's a historic value to it. But his issue is uh, kind of... It's, it's fine. It's pretty much his worst Spider-Man work from the era, but he'll make up for it doing his Amazing Spider-Man run, so it's not a big deal. And I can't quite tell, and I would love to hear your opinions if you read this era. Like, by this point, everyone's still imitating Romita, like the senior, the father, but it, it is getting a little old. Like, I, I love Romita's art, but it is a little like, okay, I could use a little bit of a different take here, and, you know, everybody has a little bit of a personality, but it's like I, I kind of am yearning a little bit more of a, cre a stronger creative force behind Spider-Man. And, you know, maybe that's why I don't really like some of the artists here, because they're just doing a bit of a take on Romita, and uh, I don't know. It all starts to blend together. There's a Scorpion story during this era, issue 21, I believe, and this issue is a very interesting take on Scorpion. Like, he's gone insane here, and when I say insane, I mean, like, he's cr he's crazy. He, he's, like, hallucinating. He's, like, sitting in a room talking to himself. Well, he's not sitting in a room. He's in a sewer talking to himself, like, oh, I hate everybody. I hate Spider-Man. <laughs> And, and he thinks he can't take off his suit. And it's this really weird thing where it's just like, he's crazy. Like, the Spider-Man defeats him by taking off his mask. He just comes off. Scorpion just doesn't register that. It's weird. Like, it's just a weird take on Scorpion. And I honestly don't really have feelings on it. Like, I don't hate it, but it's just weird. Like, I, I feel like I haven't seen him this crazy. Eh, crazy. Like, he's always been a little unhinged, but this is just a different breed of crazy. But I will say, it is interesting that by this point, like, <laughs> Scorpion started out as one of the biggest bads of his era. He was such a big threat originally, and here, he goes down in, like, one punch or something. He's really, like, after, like, he got, like, two great issues, and after that, it's just, like, they just keep doing him dirty. They just keep treating him as nothing. I don't get it. Like, why does everybody hate the Scorpion? It's like, it's like Scorpion is like the M Mary Jane of villains, like, just... Stop treating him like that. Please, I'm begging you. Give me at least one good story. Please. It's our being a Scorpion fan, man. <laughs> we'll always have Ditko, at least. A very interesting standout is the Lizard storyline. Lizard is one of the most iconic Spider-Man villains, but he is undeniably quite repetitive. As Connors does something stupid, turns into Lizard, Spider-Man gives him an antidote. In the 70s, the writers kind of gave him a new shtick. He's no longer a villain of the story, he's kind of a, treated as a third party. In issue 100, Morbius is the main villain with Lizard working as a secondary antagonist to complicate the story. Stegron attacks the city with his pack of dinosaurs, yes, it's a very real story. And uh, Lizard helps Spidey fight them as a, kind of an uneasy ally. Now we have a new Lizard story, and once again, this time, Connors isn't the main villain, he actually transfers his consciousness into an iguana, and the iguana gains Connors' memories and the lizard's personality. 100% makes sense so far. Connors comes to the conclusion just because Spider-Man beat Lizard 10 times before doesn't mean he'll do it again, so Connors turns himself into the lizard on purpose in order to help. Then the lizard decides to join with the iguana, because iguana literally has the same exact goals and personality as the lizard. Good one, Connors. A little prank for you, like, <laughs> good job, you... I don't even know what to say, you idiot! This is a fine shake-up, I guess. Uh, it's, uh, Lizard is treated as routine by this point, so Mandlo seems to have wanted to break up the formula. So the second uh, Lizard story turns Spider-Man into the Spider-Lizard. Now Connors is the one who has to find a way to fire, give the Lizard the serum, which is so much harder because Connors, of course, has no powers. He's a regular-ass dude, and Lizard is this. He, at least he doesn't turn himself into a Lizard, so on purpose again, so that's an improvement. He, he does it by asking Spider-Lizard if he would drink the antidote. Lizard says no, and then walks off. Connor pulls out a second antidote and sucker punches the lizard. It's a cool twist on the lizard formula. It's the most exciting lizard has been in a while, I think. It's a cool story. I really appreciate it. The book also also has some really silly storylines, like obviously people turning into lizards, but there's a walking corpse who's revived by a bunch of bees. And, you know, like, the villain is a beehive. Like, living bees. <laughs> <laughs> On my command, slay the one called Spider-Man. Ah, bees all over me, stinging through my costume, and there's nothing I can do except die. <laughs>
<laughs> That's that comic book wackiness I, I you know, was waiting for. <laughs> Spider-Man defeats the beehive by covering himself in pesticide, and then he walks into the beehive and the bees can't sting him, they can't come close to him because, right, like, it's, he's covered in, uh, like, this poison, right? And that's how he defeats them. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's really great. Super pesticide. That's the solution. <laughs> Later in the run, the old cast kind of gets pushed aside as well. Flash kind of completes his character arc with Shaw Shaw and kind of just disappears. MJ, of course, kind of gets put into the backseat after Wolfman takes over. Harry's just straight up not here, and they're, everybody's replaced with a new college cast, who are basically the new kids on the block, and they are not really making a very good impression. Up until the point I've read, they real, there's really nothing to say. There's the dude with, from the White Tiger storyline, you know, so if you're a fan of White Tiger and that whole thing, then hooray for you. <laughs> There is Deborah Whitman, who is kind of the new love interest, this really shy, awkward, ang anxious girl. Very relatable, I will give them that, but... This, not, like, I'll be honest, like, so far, reading O'Neill's run and the Spectacular hasn't quite given me more than that. And I'm not really feeling that connection between her and Peter. And then there is Marcy Kane who is, like, I don't quite know yet what they're doing with her, and I don't really recognize her. Like, I don't... I honestly can't think of who she's supposed to be. So honestly, she's kind of a mystery for me. She's basically new Gwen. Like, Peter goes to the school, and she bullies him. So far, the cast has not won me over there. They haven't had a whole lot of chances to really make an impression, but nobody here stuns like MJ did. And you know what? Looter is back doing this run, and you know what? I, I'm very happy about that. I have a soft spot for Looter. I don't know what it is. I really can't pinpoint it. I, maybe it's a Ditko quality design. Maybe it's just the unapologetic nutcase the character is. Or maybe it's just a balloon. I don't know. I love the balloon apps un <laughs> unironically, but something about Looter just, it, it just makes me happy. I love this character so far. So he's back, and he gets a great issue where he's trying to get a meteor that will make him even more meteor-powered, and Spider-Man has to stop that, and it's, it's really fun. I love him. He's just unhinged little, little maniac, and uh, sometimes that's just what you need. Something about Looter, to me, just works. The Looter storyline, in fact, was written by Tom DeFalco. Tom DeFalco will go on to make another Spider-Man run, so we'll get to cover that. This is, again, once again, just like with Stern and Michelini, it's a bit of a preview of what's to come. I don't know if it's intentionally testing a writer or if they're just picking their favorite guest writers to give uh, runs to, but it's very interesting. And I will say, I really like Tom DeFalco's writing here, I think, I, but I can't tell if it's just because <laughs> just because I, he wrote the Looter story. I have a sauce, but Looter just does it for me. Maybe it's that, I can't tell, but I'm very positive on it. I don't really normally read spin-offs, like I really don't like hopping between multiple titles to read a book, like I, I just wanted to pick up a book and read it. It is the better book, this is what Spider-Man I feel like should have been this era, this is the main story almost. So there are some really major developments here still that you might want to at least read those specific storylines, like Flash's relationship with Shasha. If you're reading this era, read Spectacular, like it is worth it. In this case, I think the spin-off is far better than the mainline book.